<clears throat> Salutations, respected viewers. Here I am um, outside Ormley Lodge in the village of Ham, which is uh, just on the edge of London. Yes, Ham like the meat. So uh, Ormley Lodge is an early 18th century house. You see it's a Georgian mansion built when this was uh, well into the countryside. But um, its most notable resident is the um, late Sir James Goldsmith. So James Goldsmith uh, was known as Jimmy to his chums. I wasn't among them. And he was born in the United Kingdom in 1933. He was um, French uh, on his father's side, British, British on his mother's side, he was Jewish. His father was a um, conservative-minded uh, hotelier and a very wealthy man. But uh, so Goldsmith grew up in this country, but he also regarded himself uh, as French. Uh, he went to Eton and he was gambling from a very early age. But um, gambling was severely restricted at the time. I'm not sure how he managed it. And famously, at the, end of, at the age of 16, um, he won an awful lot of money on horses and he took the whole house at Eton, he divided into houses, about 50 boys each, took the whole house out to dinner and announced that he was too rich to be a schoolboy and was leaving the school, which he promptly did. So he went into business. I mean, he must have done national service and all those, those days, all uh, British boys had to do two years in the armed forces. Likewise, as a Frenchman who had had to do that, I don't think he had to do both. Um, and he, he decided not to go to university that was worthless, so he thought, wasn't an academic sort. sort. So yes, he started off um, in a very affluent fa family, but he made a staggering sum of money. I not, don't quite understand what his businesses were. So he um, uh, married this Paraguayan heiress who he fell deeply in love with. She was only about 18 at the time, he was about 25. And her father was irate, he very much disapproved of uh, his daughter marrying um, James Goldsmith and said, we are not in the habit of marrying Jews. To which Goldsmith replied, we are not in the habit of marrying Red Indians because the Paraguayan family, they're partly um, indigenous people. Anyway, so um, his wife, um, uh, she was heavily pregnant when she suddenly died. I can't remember what of, but the baby died too. So James Goldsmith uh, was uh, distraught. But uh, when he eventually recovered from his bereavement, he was part of the 1950s jet set. You must remember that, that flying was prohibitively expensive for most people in the 1950s. There's thought to be a very glamorous group of um, super rich people who had the money to fly around the globe. So he's forever going to France, the United States, uh, the Caribbean and uh, other places. Um, so he married a couple of times, he had several children, he was also a notorious philanderer, so he never once committed fidelity. He was conservative in his politics, unsurprisingly, but like his um, father before him, he was concerned for the natural world. He thought we shouldn't have constant growth if that meant concreting over the green belt, if that meant destroying beautiful landscape, species going extinct, do we really want more cars on the road and more pollution and so on? And he held this view far before it was fashionable when conservatives usually said capitalism, we just must have growth at all costs in rich people. But um, even though the goldsmith said, professed to care deeply about uh, the world around us, he still lived in great opulence. If you really care about the environment, stop flying, get rid of your car, or at least have one small car, not a big gas guzzler. Live in a small house which doesn't use loads of electricity to heat it, to light it and so forth. So he said he didn't practice what he preached. Um, and uh, he spent some time in the United States building up his businesses there. He didn't inherit his uh, knighthood. He was knighted by the Queen as some sort of captain of industry creating jobs. He was a good friend of John Aspinall going to the Claremont Club um, in London on Berkeley Square because until the 60s there were severe restrictions on gambling. If you're a member of a private club you could gamble there. So John Aspinall and others they set up this club and it was very she she. It was super expensive. You had to go there in a dinner jacket, ladies in an evening dress and of course they'd be smoking and drinking and possibly dining whilst playing roulette or various card games. Um, because they were members of a private club, it was allowed, but huge amounts of money changed hands. Often titled people were going along. It was a very snobby era. I think it's like the Noel Coward song, England Loves a Lord. Um, the Earl of Lucan went, Lucky Lucan, so he's part of his social circle. Um, Lord Lucan, who notoriously disappeared in 19, 1974, having murdered his, his um, children's nanny, Sandra Rivett, one whilst attempting to kill his wife accidentally killed the wrong woman in the dark. That was Lord Lucan, who's never been seen since. But uh, anyway, so back to um, uh, James Goldsmith. Um, so uh, yeah, he was one of, really the, one of the titans of British business at the time, built up a fortune of hundreds of millions of pounds. 
In the 70s, he started having an affair with um, uh, the Marcus of Londonderry's uh, daughter. She was about 30 when, when their relationship started, and he had um, uh, two children with her. And in those days, being born outside of marriage was considered to be um, deeply embarrassing. Still in the 70s, children would be insulted for that, particularly in upper-class circles. So it's quite surprising that she gave birth to his children, even though she wasn't wed to him. And he finally got divorced and married her. So he had Jemima, and he had Zach, and then he had Ben. Ben is the only one who was born after they got married. But they always bore his surname Goldsmith. And he set up a nightclub, Annabelle's, named after his mistress, later wife, Annabelle Goldsmith. Um, Lady Goldsmith, perhaps I should call her, and it still exists, I believe. So um, that was that. But he became increasingly disenchanted with the Conservative Party in the early 90s. He became Eurosceptic. He'd been elected to the European Parliament for, for a French constituency. So um, he was a man of eclectic opinions. As I say, um, uh, concern for ecology didn't sit well with conservatism, certainly in the 80s and the early 90s. So he was perhaps ahead of his time. And uh, then he set up the referendum party, said if the United Kingdom is to join the Eurozone, get rid of the pound sterling, we must have a referendum on this. And I went to a talk by him in early 1997. And I wonder whether it's something to do with his business interests, possibly. But he claimed by that stage he divested of himself of all his business interests. He wasn't doing this for personal emolument. He was actuated solely by a wish to promote the common wheel. Uh, anyway, so the referendum party said we were going to stand at this election and make people take it seriously. They knew they weren't going to be driving up the mail to become the government, try and contest every city in Great Britain, none in Northern Ireland actually, um, because there must be a referendum if the pound is to be got rid of. You might think getting rid of the pound is a good thing, fair enough, but there should be a referendum on such a crucial decision. And he extracted a promise from the leader of the three major parties, Labour, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, that they would hold a referendum um, on getting rid of the pound if they proposed to do so, and they would only in introduce the euro as the currency of the United Kingdom if a majority approved of that in a, in a um, pre-factum referendum. Um, so that's that. Obviously, you can't trust politicians. They will renege on a promise faster than you can say Jack Robinson. Just look at the people who vowed to honour the result of the Brexit referendum, trying to undo it in many cases. Uh, Labour and the Lib Dems, the Liberal Democrats who are so keen on referenda because they always, always lose elections. Um, finally, a referendum that can occasionally be on the winning side. But anyway, um, so he stood in the 97 election. The referendum party was going to take away one or two percent of the vote, mainly from the Conservatives. And it was, it was, a, it was a really um, a mix and gather of people who previously belonged to other parties. A sitting Conservative MP, Sir George Gardner, defected to it. They got various celebrities, very, various apolitical people, television presenters to, to stand for them. And um, David Bellamy, who was then very well known on telly for doing programmes about plants. Um, so George Gardner did, did quite well and Reigate, his own old seat, was still lost, getting about 10% of the vote, their top figure. Obviously they're going head to head with UKIP. Now Nigel Farage was in UKIP and suggested they have formed some sort of pact. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't really compete with the referendum, referendum party. Much bigger party, much more funding and much more media attention. They had big names on their side. But the leader, um, Dr. Alan Sked, said, no, 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 we'll, be, we'll have no uh, alliance with them. Anyway, they might have deprived the Conservative Party of 10 or 20 seats, the referendum party. Some people who voted referendum wouldn't have voted at all rather than vote for the referendum party. Uh, so what else are I going to say about uh, Goldsmith? So he stood in Putney against David Meller, who was um, some sort of minister for sport or culture, had um, been disgraced by his affair with um, uh, that Spanish actress, Antonia de Sanchez. Anyway, um, so uh, yes, um, he lost Goldsmith in Meller, but sorry, in, in Putney, but David Meller also lost and Labour took that seat for the first time in decades. So obviously the winning candidate gave his first, he gave the speech first, his acceptance speech, and then um, coming second, David Meller gave a speech at this stage, Jemima Khan, uh, sorry, Jemima Goldsmith, as then she was, um, uh, Sir, Sir James Goldsmith's daughter, just married Imran Khan, the former captain of the Pakistani cricket team, and his party, Tehrak e Insaf, the, the movement for justice, had performed dismally in the Pakistani election, winning not a single constituency in the National Assembly. And so Mela, um, he um, gave this blistering uh, speech denouncing um, Goldsmith and um, expressing his withering contempt for the referendum party, saying that Goldsmith has failed just as abysmally as his son-in-law failed in Pakistan. But um, it didn't seem to upset Jimmy Goldsmith one whit. He, along with the others, were chanting, out, 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 just relishing it. 
as in Mel had been voted out. But that was that. Now, what um, Goldsmith had not disclosed until this point is that he knew he was terminally ill. And he flew off to Mexico that August. He decided he'd die in his Mexican estate. So this is sort of the last hurrah for him. Some people were irked by him uh, hijacking this election. He knew he couldn't win, skewing the result. But some people say we have him to thank for this. Otherwise, Blair would have been very tempted to get rid of the sterling to make the UK join the Eurozone, which would have been calamitous in all sorts of ways. And I don't know of anybody now who's, now who's saying that the UK should join the Euro or even regrets that. Actually, if the UK joined it, leaving the EU would have been a lot more difficult. So from a, from a Euro fanatic perspective, it's a pity that Blair didn't have the courage of his convictions and go for it. It is hard to realize now just how adored and trusted Blair was for the first few years. Iraq put paid to all that. Anyway, so he died. Um, he had a memorial service a few months later in Smith Square, London, that church. Ironically, it's across the street from what was then the headquarters of the Conservative Unionist Party, which he'd done so much to uh, undermine, really contributed to their um, uh, very heavy defeat in 1997. Um, but he survived John Major's government only by about three months. Anyway, Ormley Lodge is where he spent most of his time in London. You know, he also had houses in France, Mexico, and other places. So his widow, Lady Annabel Goldsmith, lives there. We just saw a big black car drive out. So I don't know if she was in that one or not. So his son, Zach Goldsmith, is, is Conservative MP for Richmond Park, editor of The Ecologist, campaigner against the third runway for Heathrow. And he stood to be mayor of London, but Sadiq Khan bested him. Um, what else? Ben Goldsmith, his son, he's made a lot of money in business. Not really difficult if you start out with hundreds of millions to play with and all the right contacts. And his, his um, uh, daughter Jemima, she divorced Imran Khan. They had two children. Not sure where she lives. So that is Albury Lodge and the Goldsmith family. So please support me on Patreon, support me on PayPal. PayPal's much actually easier. GeorgeCallahan79 at gmail.com. You find me on PayPal. Book online lessons with me. Uh, I'm very grateful for your support. Such liberality is absolutely crucial to sustaining this channel. And also book me as a, as a tour guide in London. Um, direct message me. You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, and indeed on Instagram.